But what's really incredible is that it dawned on us, it's 10 years of MTF. So we are actually celebrating. <laughs> and this wonderful series of photographs taken by Andrea Grincerrato, um, who's one of our wonderful, wonderful members, um, you know, really kind of illustrate the, the incredible community. Um, and, and this guy's hiding under there is Reeps. Um, who has been with us in so many uh, uh, events, but also, I mean, he's just an incredible person. Um, what's he now? Reaps 100, I think, is his website. But um, yeah, Reaps 1 and Reaps 100. Look him up. Uh, he's done incredible stuff with AI and voice uh, and, uh, uh, and also spoken at the United Nations about um, the importance of voice as a... Uh, uh, means for inclusivity and also as a means for um, uh, for diplomacy, really. Um, so, um, incredible people. I mean, I could I could go through each one of these, but there we, we are over eight thousand contributors to date uh, from New Zealand to Alaska. Absolutely incredible. So, this is how it all started. It was um, this is us with the London Symphony Orchestra at the Barbican in London. And so my first point was, let's put uh, science and art and academia and industry, scientists and artists and academics and people from industry, all in the space of common understanding. And people just laughed at me. They said it was completely impossible to do because they said that these people speak different languages. They just, you know, they, they operate in totally different mental spaces. Um, and I went, well, you know, I've, I've actually got some good experiences from running stuff with students at Royal College of Art and also at Goldsmiths where we would bring people from completely different backgrounds, but it had to be a neutral ground and it had to be hands-on. It had to be a place where you do not um, rely on jargon to understand each other because that's just a complete barrier. That's not to say jargon's a bad thing, I, I will mention that, um, because each domain has a really good vocabulary to describe the intricacies of what they are looking at, and that's important. But when you try and bring people into a space of common understanding, there is something else that needs to happen, it needs to be physically um, happening, it needs to be a, a, a presence is important, but translating thought into practice as well, um, which was really much, very much at the center. Oh, how about audio? Let's stop this for a second. Are we, have we, are we connected? We bit buzzy? Shall I try again? So I will show you some of the first series of experiments in the first, say, a uh, few years, two, three years. Just a little selection, one minute, so that you get the feel for, you know, we put music as a center as a social glue. The boys called me the Towering Inferno, but perhaps because the headmaster was also a pipe smoker. <laughs> Yeah. 
So if anybody recognized that voice uh, was Stephen Fry, he actually gave us all of his recordings to play with. So we, like, we get noticed by these kinds of people, or this amazing, amazing design by Miriam Bleu, the artist from Canada. Uh, we brought her in to the Centre Pompidou um, uh, to, to, to perform with her, with her invention. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a piece of art as well as ingenious interface. Uh, for uh, DJing uh, and mixing, and, and uh, this one actually got honorable mention by Ars Electronica the following year. Uh, and this is the sort of pattern that started to happen. We put music at the center as, social, as a social glue between all these people who were, some of them were physicists and some of them were designers, you know, and they were all coming together and doing these crazy things. Um, and this is, for example, <laughs> us doing a complete jam, um, a kind of cacophony session, if you like. This was called Geek Punk. <laughs> this is uh, Lou Edmonds from Public Image Limited, who'd hacked into a half Turkish and half some other ethnic guitar. And then people who had hacked into Wiimotes that afternoon. And then um, some, uh, uh, there was a 3D printer on drums. And this is 8 o'clock on a Saturday night at the Barbican, the London Symphony Orchestra, and I'm like going, oh my gosh, this is gonna be terrible. And then um, they all jump up on stage, and the audience loves it, because it was this kind of, it was noise, but it was the good kind of noise, you know, that actually makes you completely instantly respond to it. And at that time, it felt, because music was being so overproduced, you know, it was so removed. I mean, okay, music production is another art form and it's fantastic, but there was nothing immediate, you know, about music at that point. And so this is 2014, you know, we are actually challenging this idea. So um, that, was, um, that was the London Symphony Orchestra. Kids on stage. I love the way she gets into it. So she just spent three hours building this, never touched a piece of electronics, never touched programming languages, never touched, you know, pretty much not really interested in computers. That's what her parents uh, told me. There were a whole bunch of kids whose parents were also there. And uh, then afterwards they came and said, she wants to do computing now, how did you do this? <laughs> but she's like on the stage at the London Symphony Orchestra, this is really, really important. Why is it that we have a performance at the end of this week? Why are you all asked to actually jump on stage and express yourselves uh, with everything that you've created? It's so important to actually communicate, to actually have a human experience and not just have this kind of little, whatever it is, it is a composition, a gadget, whatever it is, as, a, as a, in isolation, but it is something that has to be part of the whole kind of system of expression. We are effectively communicating new knowledge in, or communicating knowledge in new ways. That's what she's doing. She just learned something, created something in three hours. She's actually able to express herself with it, with this new bit of kit or knowledge or, uh, or sound expression that she's created. And in front of audiences, and then the audience it just loves it. You know, they love when the kids, kids do that. So they get, they, their confidence grows as a result. And it does, it does grow for every single person in the room here. For instance, all of the seasoned experts still are challenged during this week and they still build, you know, as a result. So, Here's us in New Zealand. So we went on tour as a result of kind of these accessories because I started this as, oh, we're going to do a couple of workshops. This is 2012. Uh, hey, presto, I have uh, 500 people wanting to do a festival with, you know, BBC, EMI, you name it, you know, Warp. So first, all the indie records, Warp and Ninja Tune and all of those guys, and, and going, we are in. If you're going to do this as a creative thing and not as a boring conference, we are in. So then suddenly 500 people, we had to go and get extra money from the regional development fund. And then as this thing just started to grow and we were asked to do it again, it wasn't, it wasn't even in the corner of my mind this was going to happen. I mean, it's like this kind of giant thing that's suddenly dragging you forward. Uh, we are invited to go on tour, much to, uh, it's actually Dubber's fault, I think, mostly. He kind of fixed it. And so, in 2014, we did five events. And just London had 90 people on stage. Just insane. I mean, I don't even know how we survived, but this was, this was uh, uh, New Zealand and, uh, you know, 
uh, crossing cultures. The guy on the right is, is, is a hip-hop artist, but of course what they love to do is, is to, to um, uh, dress up in a traditional costume with a traditional instrument. So, they, so what happened was that Adam John Williams, another absolute genius who came out of this community, I had hacked a, an Australian didgeridoo, blocked it from one side, connected it to an iPad, was feeding synthetic sound through the didgeridoo, which was double amplified because it was blocked, and then he was beatboxing with it on the other end. So he created this kind of nut, n n instrument that was certainly nuts, and they were loving it. So they brought this incredible ancient carved things and said, can you hack into this? And we're like, uh, uh, well, you know, surely you don't want us to attach kind of like electronics. So anyway, it was just awesome. It was just such a great atmosphere in the room. And then, um, and then you have people like Robertina Shebinich, who was with us last year here in Aveiro, um, coming in to, um, uh, to our event in, in, in Ljubljana after she had created this unbelievable piece, which later got her two um, uh, honorable mentions by Ars Electronica and a fellowship with Ars Electronica. I mean, she's just gone from strength to strength. Um, uh, and and uh, this is uh, incredible. It's a huge tank of jellyfish. And the jellyfish communicate with chemical reaction. And what happens is that uh, Robertina will convert that into signal and she will play music back to the system. So basically it's a beyond human system that she creates as a performance. Um, it's, it's, it's really stunning. And she's done incredible work since. And last year hooked up with Sophie Crespo and Felican McCormick here and uh, again went to another amazing project. This is us in Berlin, and Berlin was a bit, bit of a milestone in many ways. I will mention that later, but I wanted to point out that this was Berlin was 2016 during the biggest influx of um, one of the one of the things that was framed as a big immigration crisis in Europe uh, from 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 Syria, and all of the borders were shut, and everything was really kind of nasty. And I, I personally think that that could have been uh, could have been framed better, uh, but. Uh, uh, at that time, we uh, fought uh, to get a visa for Ahmad Bakri on the right from Palestine to be able to collaborate with Ranidar from Israel and uh, combining ancient and modern instruments. And they were um, they performed on stage. There were several other kind of um, things that were bridging diplomacy. Also, we had Iranians collaborating with Israelis, etc. And uh, Iranians that got told off by their families, all kinds of interesting things like that. Um, as a result of this bringing people together, um, this was to back 2014, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MTF Boston. Uh, we are there with MIT, Harvard, and uh, in the middle of uh, Microsoft Research Nerd Labs. And then this bunch of luminary academics, absolutely amazing people decide that after seeing three days of what this crowd does is that we need a manifesto for this field. And they are academics from all kinds of disciplines, including the guy who wrote the history of the MP3, Jonathan Stern, and Nancy Baim, who's an absolute like genius academic. She's been a role model for us for, for a long time. And so basically, they, the two of them decide to assemble all these incredible people and say, we're writing a manifesto for you guys. And this manifesto is still online. You can see it being signed by hundreds of signatures, including poli policymakers. Because what happened was, you know, when someone, this is just a quote from it, when someone s puts this in front of me, I'm like, wow, okay, so I've got actually a serious kind of job on my hands because this has to be true. If for this to be true, we need to actually keep proving that it is true. We need to actually demonstrate this is really true. And so the first thing we did was from this, because I was, as I was headhunted, you know, MTF originally kind of actually started because I was headed by the European Commission to direct the future of music tech in Europe. It's, they call it a roadmap of uh, music information technology, but basically, effectively that. And as, a, as part of that, I wanted to do these workshops. It wasn't really on, the, on paper that we should do that, but that's what I did. Um, and, and then as soon as I started doing that, they actually put me into industry advisory together with Siemens and Intel and uh, people from industry. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I said, well, if they're interested in what we're doing, you know, I'll keep feeding this and see what they take on board. And they kept on like, they're going, wow, this is really interesting. Yeah, this kind of method you introduced, um, right, let's put it into recommendations. 
So this is how it started with me, with the recommendations to the innovation program, like constantly feeding it directly from here. And we took this directly to the creative unit in Luxembourg. This is the uh, research in the creative sector, which is now everywhere, but it was at that time only in Luxembourg, and took it over there. And it's undersigned by politicians uh, already. So what I did as a result is create this pilot program where I was like, okay, here's, here's the deal. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do... Uh, tech transfer by doing interfaces, uh, so APIs were being talked about, but not hugely at the time. We demonstrated the power of that. Um, take it through some test beds, um, basically applied for funding for a pilot where I, we could fund some of the good ideas that come out. Introduced into European contracts something called Innovation Party IP, so that each one of you can get can be have firm hold of their own intellectual property. It's a big deal. I've done a lot since, and it's it's getting much bigger now. And then introduce something because they have this thing from NASA called technology readiness levels, which means you need to literally build, wait to build an entire rocket before you can even test it. And I'm like, no, we are just experimenting with cheap and cheerful stuff, and what we need is market adoption, so just to see how quickly our community can contribute in co-creation. Anyway, these were some of the things, all fed up, uh, fed to, to the recommendations. I was asked to coordinate innovation recommendations for the whole research program for the EU, which is enormous, the biggest one in the world. And um, these were the sort of things that happened. It was like, uh, you know, in, in month five, this is 2015, we create the first so, microboard that can create new affordances for some of the data libraries from IRCAM that was uh, that were that uh, you know they they put into the project, and then uh, lots of people start to embed them in all kinds of product ideas, and uh, one of them uh, created a uh, well some most of them created working prototypes by month nine, but one of them started part patenting already in month 10, and that's because we took care of the intellectual property of the inventor as being another layer, innovation layer on top, and all of the big guys who participated, including Fraunhofer and stuff, had to sign on the dotted line to say that they are not, uh, Fraunhofer, sorry, for you, those of you who don't know, biggest research organization in, in Europe, it's the German national one. Um, th uh, they had to sign on the dotted line that inventors could use their assets to create new kinds of ideas, and they were, their lawyers were not allowed to clamp on them then afterwards and just take them away. I mean, and we I fought this, constantly I fought this in, in, in the US at one point. I told people to, I told lawyers in the US to just go back and rewrite and give me a one-page contract, otherwise we're going into someone's bedroom and and making things there because we don't care. We don't need to be part of this space where they're going to steal our IP. And I won, of course. Um, so, uh, so um, this is some of the. Uh, these are some of the guys. I'm just going to do guys here. Um, uh, uh, Vahaken, uh, as a result, you know, of, of some of the uh, incubation processes. Innovators under 35 by MIT, uh, 30 under 30 Forbes Israel. Uh, for 1 million euro follow-up funding, uh, uh, patent filing for AI for primary industry. Just to show you, this was just a few, and this was the ecosystem that was just growing and growing, and so you would get people like Volvo and Philips knocking on our doors, and all the tech companies are saying, can we, can we work with you guys? Um, so basically, I kept on feeding that up into innovation recommendations, and as a result, 74% of innovation recommendations for the uh, uh, Connect Advisory Forum, this was the industry forum that I was part of, came directly from us here, from, from the grassroots creative experimentation, demonstrating evidence what is possible, um, influenced things quite a bit, because you will fi 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 find threads of that, I can safely say, you can follow the thread of this through across the sort of funding programs now. And the presence of cultural creative sector as a pivot in the middle of all this is, is, is now substantial. So the first person who seems to have noticed was probably Joey Ito, I would say, because he sent his students to us in Berlin uh, to work with us, and then they made, he commissioned a documentary to be made about us, which you will see on our website. 
But then I think he was advising Obama, because Obama, in the last month of presidency, was uh, guest editing Wired in the US, and was asked to list the future technology frontiers. And uh, um, Victoria Modesta, as, uh, as uh, at that uh, moment, our, uh, the person that I asked to represent a community that was growing over 5,000 at the time, um, represented us and the MTF community as a full page in, in, in there. And I had no idea. <laughs> and we had no idea this kind of happened and, and it was, uh, it was a, a, a real kind of, you know, we're just working really hard and actually barely surviving at that time because Deborah and I were really investing everything we had into this. And, um, and then it, this kind of happens and you go, oh, okay, now, now what? Um, so Victoria, this is Victoria, if you haven't uh, seen her before, some of you have seen her uh, also in my speeches because I do pull her up a lot. I did deliberately ask her to be um, the role model for our community and someone we could all aspire to. That was the idea. The idea was, and I think it's very easy to do that, because she's uh, really not afraid to push boundaries. She's, uh, you know, female, she's super intelligent, she's incredibly talented as an artist, she's been starring in series in the US, she's closed the Paralympics in London, she's done all this kind of stuff. Amazing. But what we did um, in our labs in uh, Berlin, uh, this is the, the, some of the famous, well, famous, some of the stories that I have really pushed forward, uh, and now lots of people know about them, uh, because I felt this was a way to illustrate to decision makers just how important what we're doing is. Um, Victoria was fitted with all kinds of sensors in our labs in Berlin. She, I, sort of, we put her in the center uh, of the lab, and this was the first time we ran labs for a whole week, and this was very much thanks to Peter Kern, who had been trying this kind of format at Transmediale. So it's not our invention by any means, but we took it on because Peter uh, co-curated them. Uh, that year, so he said, how about we do a whole week of like proper intense labs? And this format turned out to be incredible for us. So, so she was fit, she was in the center, all of the people were working on uh, enabling new forms of expression and basically saying, okay, how can we turn, how can we give her the possibility to be uh, absolutely extraordinary and someone that everybody can aspire to? So for instance here, you know, some of the things that uh, happened were playful. This is Anouk Wiprecht design of a prosthetic leg that actually uh, is uh, sensor activated and creates smoke for the stage. Um, so the rest of Victoria's dress is completed by the smoke here, which kind of gives you a little bit of that sort of Marilyn Monroe image. Um, except in a kind of, you know, the, the one with the white dress being um, lifted by, by wind, and this one is a dress that's made by smoke with a carbon fiber body, slightly different. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, fitted Victoria, so this is Chico, so um, uh, Francisco um, Teixeira and uh, Horacio Marx uh, and Luis Años. Uh, where's Luis this year? I haven't seen him. Um, uh, so basically, the guys uh, from Mew Arts who fitted Victoria, they, they combine neurofeedback and, and, um, and uh, um, uh, arts. Uh, so very unique group here in Portugal. Um, I've done some incredible things. So um, they fitted Victoria with neurofeedback sensors, and then they programmed, the, they hooked the rest of the crowd, hooked it to um, be able to um, control projection mapping and lights directly from her brain. And then we thought, well, we'll see how much she can do while she's also dancing and singing. And then this is another mode of expression, but you need to train your brain to be able to do that. Um, and by the end of the week, she was able to do it. So we thought, this is really amazing. Um, so basically, uh, uh, you see here, and this is another wonderful thing, you see the amount of women in the lab, so these are some of the MIT students, but then um, also Fanny at the top, she's, uh, she, she, after that, she was the winner of the first uh, Hungarian National Video Awards. So she's in the US uh, now uh, doing a post-grad. Uh, but lots and lots of women in the lab, and this was the norm for us. Um, it became the norm for us, this was awesome. So, and then when we were, uh, I, I launched the music track at Slush in 2016, and I said, what do you want to do next year? And I said, well, okay, we can bring our labs, cook up something for five days, and then open Slush. 
with a performance that will challenge your usual three-minute pitch because we want people to experience what's just been created, uh, have, it, have this as a visceral experience or a really show what technology does for human beings. And so this is Rika Hanenen, um, uh, very proud to be a blind singer and a vocal coach from Sibelius Academy. Next to her is Yasmin Isdrake, who had been uh, uh, co-curating with Peter Kerr in our labs, absolutely amazing innovator uh, from Sweden. Um, and uh, uh, lots of people from, um, that's, a, that's actually a Ukrainian guy in the corner there who was supposed to be just a volunteer and thought he was going to be sitting in the cloakroom until we, dis we discovered he had lots of talents and we put him on stage. Um, so, huge amount of different people. And then, uh, sorry, it's a bit dark in here, but audience participation. So, when you, you know, when you have a launch of something like Slash, you have start. 20,000 people, startups and investors, they're there to network. They're not going to be sort of into kind of audience participation. But we said, okay, so first thing what we're going to do is something really simple because Rika said, you know what? I mean, I wonder if you can help me with your kind of um, innovation sort of stuff with digital because I, when I sing, I can't see how the audience feels because, I, I mean, I can't see them, so I don't know how they feel. And so we did something super, super simple. We said to the audience, to audience, who wants to be fitted with pulse sensors so you can, you can communicate your emotions or your, your, your basically your heartbeat to the, to, to the, to the singer and, and then, and then uh, basically create this beautiful feedback loop. And there was like this rock and roll moment. We had, didn't have enough of them. Everybody wanted to be part of it. Everybody there with mobile phones. So it was very, very interesting for us to get this kind of reaction. So that was something very, very simple. And then... We took that neurofeedback thing, or the guys from Murads took the neurofeedback thing forward. So what they turned up with, they said, okay, do you know what we've done? We've taken the system that's used for clinical trials for people with anxiety attacks. So what you do is you visualize their brain activity, and usually when they have an anxiety attack, before they are conscious of it, the pattern, their brain pattern already changes. So it shows symptoms that they might get an attack. So what you use as a clinician is this system so that you can start to train them to control it. And I said, okay, great, that sounds cool. And then they said, but we've actually changed it so that it can play the musical scale. And I went, what? <laughs> I went, okay, that's kind of cool. So what, uh, what actually happens is you put on the neurofeedback sensor and then you can train, instead of controlling your anxiety attack, to actually train to go up and down the musical scale instead, directly from your brain. I'm like, okay, that's cool, we try it. So we tried it. So people in the room were there for, um, you know, usually about two hours before they could start to move the scale. So that's actually quite amazing, <laughs> you know, take you, how long does it take you to do, uh, to play a musical instrument where you need to use motorics as well and train on that. Um, but uh, then Rika put the neurofeedback sensor on and she was able to play instantly without training. And it was like this kind of jaw-dropping moment because we were just like, hang on a minute, this is, uh, this is actually quite important because, you know, this is someone who's in the mechanical era been defined as less able-bodied because she can't see the buttons to press or move levers. But in this environment, she's far more talented than the rest of us. So who's the less able-bodied one here? You know, and so I'm like, okay, the guys upstairs need to know about this stuff. Because this is like the future of work. It's like, how do we, you know, there's all this kind of box ticking exercise by industry. Oh, we need to employ people from this, or we need to have inclusion, which means, you know, the token uh, person of different color or something ridiculous like that. And when you go like, no, 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 you're like, you're miles off here. You know, it is about completely rethinking what it means what, what contribution someone can make to the whole uh, space. You know, if someone can drive menus in this agile way, they're an incredibly useful talent to have on board. Um, but it's a whole discussion we could have. So, um, the, one of the reasons why this is also important is that the same event, we actually were um, tracking uh, intellectual property as it was being generated in real time, so we did this experiment. Uh, we kind of registered in the in in the uh, blockchain uh, together with Ocean Protocol, with co collaboration with Ocean Protocol, 
Um, and we looked at what does it mean to actually register intellectual properties. It's generated in real time so that everybody is attributed to. And this is, you know, where you have these kinds of discoveries, they need to be logged and everybody has to be part of the uh, system of attribution. This has gone a long way since, and I can tell you more about it. As se I'm in charge of several think tanks and several implementation mechanisms. European Innovation Council, in the DG Connect, which is for ICT, in, in uh, various different platforms. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, they've really listened to me on this front. I lobbied a lot for this because I said it's really important. So then as a result uh, of all sorts of these kind of mechanisms and systems that I've identified or pl put into place or tested, um, and other people have tested, sorry, not just me. I mean, the IP thing was something I insisted on, but uh, for instance, the neurofeedback thing is something that Muart's guy came up with. It was amazing. Um, so um, created something called Industry Commons because I thought, okay, we are all in the space of common understanding. Industry needs to be on board of this. Uh, and, and just to illustrate this point, we were working with the music industry originally because music industry was nose diving. It was the whole sector was going into digital, you know, right from the moment of Napster '99, and then the whole system just went crash. And Clutch will tell you all about it because he had a super well-known band um, at that time between 2000 and 2004, five kind of what we call the you know the, the kind of the <laughs> It, it was, it was a, a massive gap in the music industry when there was no marketing, no promotion, no systems, no online systems for you to promote your band. A massive, massive fan, uh, lot, uh, amazing music. I'm a massive fan of his music, um, of the band's music. And, and they were totally stuck in that period where you could... MySpace turned up, which was dreadful, you know, somewhere, what, 2004, five, something? Yeah, post Napster, pre-social media. So people like that, huge success story, massive fan lot, sell out all the gigs, great music, no chance. You know. So basically, lots of us took it upon ourselves to solve this problem and to kind of look at what are the, what's the future of the music industry. And we did a lot of, a lot of thinking and a lot of experimentation and a lot of it uh, brought uh, some good stuff, um, some good and bad stuff. Uh, some of the good stuff is evident by the... Um, incredible success, for instance, of Bandcamp that reached on this Saturday one billion payment, uh, one billion dollars paid to artists directly into their pockets, uh, and it's much thanks to Dubber uh, uh, because he wrote the book at that time. So, 2007, Dubber writes, and I, let me get this right: 20 things you must know about digital music online. Am I, did I get that about right? About right. I never can never quite get it right. Sorry. It was downloaded in half a million copies. CD Baby promoted it to everybody, and then he got a phone call from um, Ethan and, and Sean, who were had um, these two amazing guys who had just sold an email system to Yahoo, and said, um, "We've just been given your book. We want to build this thing." Uh, uh, do you want to be our advisor on this? Can you be our advisor? And he's been the advisor ever since. So uh, this, is a, this is the guy. Uh, so these are the sort of fantastic good solutions that have enabled some artists to live off Bandcamp um, full time. Uh, absolutely incredible um, uh, system, uh, very equitable, beautiful. Some other stuff where you know that some other platforms don't even allow you to buy yourself a coffee from all of your fantastic creation. So yeah, the good and the bad. But anyway, having worked in this space, having written a um, system for sim music similarity that was featured on the BBC together with um, Shazam and Pandora, and um, I basically, you know, we were saying things like all of the other industries are going to face this, this real big problem. Uh, and then people were saying to us, what, mining, chemistry, what's that got to do with music? What are you talking about? Then 2018, SAP, you know, the big company, uh, in Switzerland publishes this um, brochure that says, uh, we can now manage the entire chemical industry production from start to finish with data-driven systems. And chemical industry has a heart attack suddenly. It says, hang on, are you saying you own the tools of production now? And what are we? content, oops, so suddenly industry 
woke up. So I started harping on about this before, and I had to be very careful because it sounded totally far-fetched to most industry players. And then suddenly they started waking up. So I found something called industry commons at the European level. It became a whole track in the European program because we scaled up all of the systems that we had. So like, how do we create IP that's equitable? So we built these stacks of IP where lots of contributors can be part of it. How do we create a tech, tech transfer toolkit by using you know, APIs and then um, and on also application protocols, uh, but also creating uh, spaces for common understanding. We're currently working on something called onto commons, ontology commons, how meanings between different domains are related. And this is with all the big guys, Airbus, Bosch, Airbus, Bosch Siemens, etc. And then, you know, these market adoption readiness levels, how do we exploit the gaps between the verticals, as in verticals being industry domains, and then get create adoption to test drive some of these new solutions. All of this was went to 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 um, to the EU. Um, and it was based on this idea of an ecosystem. So we're talking ecosystem living. We are bringing it really into the real space, in the real world. But here I will stay a little bit in the virtual. So ecosystem of verticals in industry. And my thesis was, well, the verticals are slightly disintegrating because they're actually using the same methods, the same tools. They're all using digital twins. They're all using um, uh, data-driven systems. Uh, they're using APIs. So the tools are very, very similar. So some of the kind of stuff is, is literally kind of, uh, they're, they're less siloed. So what happens uh, as a danger is that you create a huge data soup out of this. Um, but what happens if you spot those gaps where things start to merge, um, you're basically looking at a cross of cultures between different domains of knowledge or different domains of industry. And as we all know, and if you work in the culture creative sector, this is obvious, as soon as you cross two cultures together, you get opportunities. And um, that means that where there are opportunities, you're creating new, potentially new values. So in all of these junctions between verticals, we are starting to create new values, and this is just super important. This is the ecosystemic approach to, to this. And then um, what happened as a result of all of this ecosystemic thinking, which is now very much on the, on the agenda uh, in, in uh, European industry, um, much thanks to some of, some of us who've been going on about it, um, this is the industry commons concept. You need to build trust, of course, in the whole system. If you, you know, like here, like level playing field, uh, opportunities for all. Then what does it, what does it mean? For so instance, you have to have this, what we call interoperability layer, as in the idea that all of these guys can talk to each other, the systems can talk to each other. Um, and you're supposedly building some innovation in these spaces. But this needs to sit atop of a system of systems, let's say, systems of agreements. We need to make sure that, for instance, we, we can embed regulation, but we can also track and trace intellectual property as it is created so everybody is properly uh, acknowledged. The systems of resilience. So for instance, if you follow Kate Raworth's donut economy model, it actually, it's designed to prevent us from overshooting on our resources. So it actually has, you, you should, we should embed this as a form of measure. Uh, systems of responsibility, so, you know, responsible AI, ethics, has to be embedded. You can't just be in isolation, kind of joining things together, as kind of quite a lot of the time technologies do. And then you have systems of beliefs at the very base of it, where we embed inclusion, for example. Uh, radical inclusion as a principle. So this is what I'm advocating for. Back to our community because that's super heavy again and I'm not going to kind of have lots of words thrown at you anymore. Um, but these are the incredible, incredible people that formed the labs in, 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 uh, uh, in uh, Stockholm uh, where we had our biggest event today. And these are guys... Again, Andrea Grincerato photographs um, 25 meters underground um, in a decommissioned nuclear reactor. And uh, uh, over 800 people prototyping, but in the reactor there were 90. And uh, completely transgenerational, this is our youngest DJ. 
uh, in Stockholm. So we had three people were from three to 83. And then I deliberately again uh, made a statement of, okay, we are going to put women in charge of all technology areas, and let's see what happens. So Imogen Heap in charge of blockchain, and also, you know, the idea that a person can be more than one thing, so not just a famous musician and artist, but also someone who's a blockchain activist, or, for instance, Danica Kragic, professor of AI and robotics, world famous, who is very famously also, what she calls herself a seamstress, but she's really a fashion designer at weekends, and she says that informs her work. Or, or Kelly Snook, who was 19 years NASA scientist, and then someone who, um, who went, to, uh, uh, went into the arts from, from that perspective. Or LJ Rich, BBC Click presenter, who's, um, who became a hacker and synesthete in our environment. So, also, not forgetting that we needed role models from policy, so I actually managed to um, get Eva Kaili, uh, member of European Parliament, um, to be our woman in the lead of politics. Eva is now deputy of the European, deputy of the whole of the European Parliament. Um, and she's someone who advocates at the junction between the sciences and the arts, very much so. Um, as a result of all of this, over 800 people hands-on prototyping and four categories of, uh, well, we had to have categories. I'm not really up for categories normally, but uh, people chose from um, uh, female, male, uh, binary, or prefer not to say, and 53% declared themselves women in a technology prototyping environment, which is not women in tech, not siloed, but a uh, transgeneration, a uh, transgender um, environment. And this is uh, part and parcel of this kind of exercise. Uh, Imogen Heap with uh, artist Martin Nicole Rogina, who facilitated 83 people to send their voices to the moon via the Dwingaloo radio telescope in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, 2.4 seconds of recording of your voice gets beamed, converted to light waves bounces literally off the surface of the moon and you get it back into your ear with the ether, sort of distorted by the ether. And why? Not because it's a scientific breakthrough, but because it actually puts people in a completely different mental frame in terms of, yeah, we are doing moonshots. Damn it, you know, that's what we are doing. And it's fine, you know, it works. You know, everybody's in that, in that mental space. Um, and then uh, The Guardian writing articles about the incredible, incredible work, like three different projects, for instance, that had to do a lot to do with accessibility. And Lauren, uh, Clarence Ardu, um, a jazz trumpeter who had a horrific accident uh, a long time before this photograph was taken, had never been able to express himself after properly. And then with the system designed by human instruments, the Hakan Matosian, whom you met here two years ago, uh, been a member of ours uh, for a long time, uh, was for the first time able to declare that he can actually properly express himself with licks and with, you know, this is this. These are huge things, and he was he's, he da he's done uh, uh, concerts since. Um, uh, uh, Tim is, I think, going to do a performance for us. Another person came out of the uh, um, the labs uh, in in Stockholm, um, and who who just thought he would kind of take a look and see what happens, and it actually completely changed his, um, his career, because he was getting a degree uh, in computer science, uh, but he was also a music DJ and producer, Vahaken and, and, and uh, also uh, Tim Yates from, um, from Drake Music in London, and Hacoustic, uh, our long-term members, designed this uh, system that allowed Tim to express himself with other parts of his body other than just the nose and the tongue. This resulted in multiple awards like Innovation uh, Incubation and uh, his music was featured two days after the festival on BBC and then later uh, recommended by Tom Robinson, BBC Six Music. And this is then the following year getting an International Sound Award at the Riepeban Festival. Uh, so uh, this is just some examples uh, of, of, of the, I mean, this, just way too many. Us in residence in the, the biggest startup, one of the biggest uh, unicorns in Europe, Infobip in, in Pula, uh, so basically gathering all of the people who work for them from 60 different uh, global locations to work with us. 
um, us in the AI Impact Lab in Örebro challenging this idea of automation uh, with uh, uh, humans in the loop. Uh, challenging also formats for music. This is Dada Bots. If you haven't heard of them, absolute geniuses. Uh, duo um, who, um, what you're seeing in the background is um, a relentless doppelganger um, track that's made by, uh, continuously made by AI on YouTube. So if you look for Dada Bots, you will see continuous tracks by John Coltrane or continuous, continuous death metal music. Um, that's uh, basically challenging the idea that the Motown length of track, three and a half minutes, was designed for a particular purpose at a particular time, you know, to have to fill in breaks in radio transmissions back in the 1940s and uh, published on a dinky little kind of vinyl that could be sold as a product is still our staple format, three and a half minute track. Uh, of course, Motown turned it into an art form. We're still trying to reproduce that. Whereas in the digital, you can have an AI-generated, trained track that is continuously evolving, and you can plug into it at any time. Um, and then, of course, we land on this... Oh, well, it's a bit of a leap, sorry. But um, we land on this moment where suddenly, after all of this work and all of this... I mean, you know, this is, and this is just a small selection of things. Uh, it's enormous, over 8,000 people, everybody, like so many human stories, so many transformations. And then um, we land on this thing where um, uh, President von der Leyen two years ago announces that she wishes to create this new European Bauhaus, a co-creation space for all of these disciplines, but particularly culture creative, and then others to, to gather around them um, to work together at the grassroots. And that connects uh, quite nicely. Uh, for the last two years, during the pandemic, we have been running um, labs here in Aveiro. It was absolutely extraordinary that the Aveiro municipality um, facilitated this incredible activity on the ground, in person, with some really challenging moments. You know, the first one we ran two years ago in Francisca will be able to testify how stressful that was because it was the worst pandemic of, of, of COVID uh, ever in Portugal uh, when, as, as we landed. And this is Anja Yermakova. I don't think she has flown in yet, but she will be here, here later. Absolutely beautiful piece using uh, fish skins that were developed uh, uh, of over three days by Monica, who is over where over there. Um, you need to talk to all these people who've had previous experiences with this, uh, with these labs, and and just uh, this is a project for uh, that's between I can't remember like at least about seven different countries, um, and it involves poetry written in three different languages and performance and uh, 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 sensors and all kinds of absolutely beautiful, and it keeps going after the after the labs. Um, this is where we're going to go today. <laughs> we're going there. <laughs> so um, the reason why this is, uh, this is kind of interesting is that this is, this is the, one of the most used systems that we have designed as human beings, Google Maps. And this is where we're going, in going into the blue, because they have no markers for where we are going. Um, and of course, if you were to apply the thinking that we had as colonialists, especially the European white types, um, to say, oh, there's this lovely land over there and we can nicely measure it now because we have measuring tools. So what we can do is say, oh, this little square is yours and we'll give you a piece of paper. Here it is. Then we could also now do with GPS here. We say, oh, let's divide it into little squares and then you can have that bit because it's just so easy to just kind of divide up. Um, there's a big problem in not having proper value markers because this is what it looks like on satellite. It's the Aveiro salt pans, and basically there are little, there are houses, there are species. It's one of the biggest, most biodiverse areas in Europe. There are, um, there is a, uh, ten centuries of activity floating on the water. And um, if you look at where that is, it's in this, again, area of blue um, uh, that uh, is not shown, but it's, it's the Ria de Aveiro. And uh, if you look at OpenStreetMap, and this is thanks to... Um, sorry, I'm going to mention Max's dad a few times. So <laughs> Max Reitzer-Smith over there with us. 
his dad, Grant Smith, was with us that year, and he said, yeah, but look, because it was his, he pointed this out to me. This is what's wonderful about having these amazing brains in the room. So, so he says to me, did you realize there are no markers, but open street map, people have drawn themselves in because they can, because that's an open platform. And then if you look at what it really looks like, if when you now go out, you will realize, because we're going to go and take the solar uh, powered boat. No, we're not. OK, something else is happening. It's a boat. Oh, not the solar panel. Oh, sorry, big panel. Sorry. Okay. Oh, we can't fit all fit on that one. You can take five people on a solar. Sorry. Sorry. I thought we were being totally eco, but then I, 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 I realized that you would probably sink it because it'd be too many. Um, so um, this is the um, this is basically the city of Aveiro that expands across the ocean because we will see that when we go out there, there are no barriers. You just walk. You carry on walking, it's another neighborhood, and it's floating on top of the water. So in the open street map, you actually realize the city extends quite a bit into this beautiful um, space where there is ecosystem living, a real example of ecosystem living. Uh, I want to point, this has uh, actually got only three Caesars on there, and uh, goodness me, okay. Oh no, yeah, so they already won an award in Paris. So. The crew over there are absolutely incredible bunch who produce this film, Wetlands, which quite a lot of you probably have seen, about the Aveiro wetland and the local community. Um, this is an old uh, thing at the top. We have, oh, I don't know, about 15 Caesars and um, won, uh, the, uh, won the award at the Paris Film Festival's best, best documentary. And um, uh, I will just let you uh, see the intro, just so you get the feel. Oh, you're horn. Okay, let's let's skip it. You're gonna see the whole thing. Sorry. Right. Okay. So I'm not gonna show you the intro, um, but you will you will get the feel for it. Um, uh, so that's basically uh, also us connecting to the real people on the ground. And so this idea of more than human ecosystems again brains in the room. Olafur Eliasson said, you know, when we started discussing at the New European Bauhaus, so just for those of you who don't know, I'm a member of the High Level Roundtable. This is an advisory group for President von der Leyen um, on this ambition of feeding from the grassroots ideas of sustainability, inclusion, and aesthetics and we rolled it across the European programs. We really have. So, um, the first thing Olafur said, and a wonderful lady called Anna, who works with um, Anna Pedersen, who works, um, uh, who's a studio manager for Olafur. You need to include, you need to really start talking more than human ecosystems. And uh, this is super important if we're going to talk sustainability. It can't just be human centric, which is where, where European policy was. And this is, you know, us embedded in the salt plan, uh, pans as uh, more than human ecosystems. So this video you're not showing later, so I can do a little intro of the, this video, right? Are we, are we good with that? Just the first bit. And so we have actually some very unique ecosystems here, and uh, they're part of this greater salt marsh system, which actually is, you know, biodiversity-wise very important. There are over, well over a thousand species recorded just in this lagoon here. Artistically, it really inspires us to think of that there are organisms that adapted uh, to these kind of environments. So how can we engage and see these areas in a new light? What kind of layers can we add to this? You know, sound, visual, etc., that help sort of um, somehow bring forth the actual importance of these air regions and areas because they really are important. Run wild, run wild, in the park, in the so, um, uh, inadvertently, I apparently posed a, a, a challenge in one of the sessions um, the first day um, when I asked if people here could make me feel the sound of the ocean. So, um, 
So this is Marta, who's with us. I think I saw her over there. And uh, that's not the only thing that she actually influenced the thinking of uh, last year's labs quite considerably, because also the Wetlands movie carries a main message that Marta emphasized, which is about uh, what we can do as humans to contribute to, to creating solutions. But I'll let you pick that up from, from, from the documentary. Um, so, so a little bit of that award stuff actually is yours as well, because I think that message was really key for, for the jury. Um, and so uh, uh, the idea is radical inclusion. Radical inclusion is not about, oh, let's tick boxes and have categories of people that we include, but let's see where we converge as the first point of departure. And this could be, you know, using the ocean as an instrument or sort of playing with Peter Keane, who should be with us again. Um, there he is. Oh, you're right at the end there. Oh, with Marta. Okay, fantastic. So, so, so like uh, Peter's done some breakthroughs in being able to measure as an oceanographer, veteran oceanographer, measure the rate of glacial melting through sound, uh, from sound measurements. Um, uh, and, uh, and then this kind of inspired a whole bunch of different things. Um, including uh, experiments in the first underwater overtone singing and being recorded here with under underwater mics. Um, so all kinds of possibilities open when we start with this idea, where do we converge, us and the environment. And there's wonderful um, uh, people who, who beam in. Uh, this is another oceanographer, uh, uh, from uh, another veteran oceanographer, but basically bringing in the ex this really incredible expertise from individual domains um, into the room. Uh, so exactly the idea of not just not blending the domains, but bringing them together. Uh, so not canceling each other out. It's very important. You know, you're not actually a mashup here. You're, each person is bringing very important knowledge to the table. And then... The idea of combining indigenous and digital technologies, we've pushed this through to now. I mean, all of these are things that we push through to the European Bauhaus. So this is, this is a discussion that's now ongoing, and I think uh, Monica will testify to this, is uh, some of her fish skins. And, um, and I believe you worked with Alexandra. Did you work with Alexandra on the design? So Alexandra was part of that team. Um, where is she now? Sorry, it's so difficult to see of you guys. And of course, Francisca. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, this is another very, very important evidence. So this you know, provides evidence-based for policy uh, makers. And then you know, this idea of following the complete life cycle of material, because they went on a Wednesday morning last year to the fish market, bought the fish, and then created the whole process uh, uh, of creating leathers and then the design and everything else. And the fish was used in food, and all rest, every part was used. Uh, but this is, this is a, an incredibly important direction for industry also, because what we are looking at do, creating systems that follow the full life cycle, control the extraction of, uh, or production of any base materials, uh, follow the whole thing through to uh, reuse or remanufacture or sustainable disposal in industry. And this, this requires cross-domain systems that can follow that. And then this idea of, we called it just ocean last year, so it was about being judicious and biased, safe and transparent as well, um, which is a thing that we've introduced into the European thing where this is about the researcher. So they are all, all about fair data. Fair data means findable, inter, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So this is about how you connect physically, kind of technically, data so that you can talk across domains. But we introduced the idea of a responsible researcher or data owner, the idea that you should aim to be judicious, unbiased, safe, and transparent. Because there's no, for instance, there's no such thing as a, an unbiased data set. There is no such thing. The, every single database uh, uh, da data is biased, is taken under particular circumstances or from a particular group of people. And if you follow Joy Bolomini's work, you will see how much damage is being done by um, systems that are designed either or by white middle-aged men. Uh, so, you know, uh, re uh, face, facial recognition systems that really, really badly... Like someone said to me that they were having a Teams meeting 
with one of the members of staff who's from um, who's African origin, they couldn't see him at all. You know, and the, 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 the app is not designed to recognize people like that at all. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous that we live in a world like that. And we, we, you know, we can't just leave it to computer scientists who are just trained to valorize data without questioning provenance. And then beyond European perspective, so these are our satellites, and we welcome our satellites. This is absolutely fantastic to have. This is Chicago talking to us last year, um, uh, IIT in Chicago. Um, and then insisting you know, in a new European Bauhaus that we need the beyond European perspective. So we are an example of this. There's all these satellites from all over around the world beaming in and bringing their perspective to the table. Uh, this um, uh, uh, beyond European perspective has also now encouraged us, uh, whilst having uh, the phenomenal Sheila Patel and, uh, and Shigeru Ban, from Asia on board of our high-level roundtable. Now we have three African-born um, uh, contributors, including um, Francis Kere, the Pritzker Prize winner for architecture. Absolutely phenomenal people, and we are so proud to have this uh, alternative perspectives that really help us. And then just to, just to tell you what sort of happened since last year, it would take me a whole other speech, and I've spoken very long time already. But this is a, um, a slide from LA. Uh, Sofia Crespo, whom some of you have met here last year, um, who then ended up collaborating with Robertina. Uh, also, uh, she works with Felican McCormick. And I believe they had moved to Lisbon as a result of being part of these labs for a couple of years. Um, let's say uh, relatively unknown two years ago, and now exhibited this is LA, uh, exhibited across huge exhibitions in LA, Chicago, Barcelona, um, going from strength to strength, just as one of the things that, because the important thing about these labs is they either continue or boost or spin out new collaborations that can really grow for the rest of the year. Um, so how many countries were there last year? Uh, 26. Uh, absolutely incredible during Corona. Uh, and then also this idea of really focusing on each region according to its needs. So, so the, the thing that we just discussed, so important that we are immersed in situ in the wetland, really understanding the challenges that a city is facing that you will see from the video are very serious. But then I translate this, so this is an example into policy, so European Committee of the Regions, I'm speaking for them on Wednesday from here. I wasn't able to, I have to pop into Brussels tomorrow, big back. Then there's another Brussels thing, week of the regions, and I'm speaking at a new European Bauhaus event there. And this is the idea we developed, the idea of, this is their slide, but I developed with them the idea that we have labs in regions, and then some of the European mechanisms pick up the best result and help us scale them towards larger funding. So the, for the very first time I managed to concatenate, I managed to get people from cohesion funds, from regional funds, from committee of the regions, all in the same room, because they never, they've, they've always worked in isolation, they also work in silos. And all of a sudden, if you actually want to scale really good ideas, cultural impacts, you know, cultural ideas, societal impacts, or any of this tech innovation or stuff like that, you need to really concatenate the funds and help them grow, and this is what we were missing in Europe. Uh, and so this is where we sort of debate, even during Corona, had to be there in person to, 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 to work on this. Uh, but ultimately, and we go back to this every single time, it is about the brilliant minds on the ground. It is not about, the guys at high level are privileged to have you. And we are not producing this for them, we are producing this, uh, we, we are doing this whole event for every single person to, to take a step forward in their personal development, project development, whichever direction you want, nothing's obligatory. You can walk out if you're fed up. If you're tired, you just go and, 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 uh, and take a break. Nothing's obligatory. It's not about forcing you to produce something that then I can feed uh, it's, uh, to, to the people at the top. It's quite the opposite. It's, I will just pay good attention as to what's happening, and anything that's valuable, I will try and translate as best I can and, and, and feed them up, because 
Um, this is our usual, we don't predict the future, we invent it. 